Hello and welcome to a very exciting and a very special episode of Bad Shot. We have with us a very special guest who's played so much international cricket, such a well-known name. Uh, he needs no introduction in a very short uh, in a very short time I will have him join our show. But before I do that, make sure you like this video, subscribe and keep watching Bad Shot. I'll be right back with Hello and welcome to uh, Bacha Dien. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, I wanted to jump right in. You're sitting in the middle of a CPL, a wonderful <laughs> tournament. How different does it feel from every other year because of COVID? Very different. Um, you know, uh, luckily I had the experience of living in the bubble and having cricket behind closed doors prior to the CPL because we did the West Indies series in England um, yeah. over July. So coming in, coming back into another bubble here in Trinidad and operating without the crowds is not unfamiliar, but CPL is so much about the music, the dancing, the crowds that that part in itself has taken some adapting to. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's it's the glamour is gone for some reason. It's funny to watch the the video, the games online or through the stream and hear the sounds, but you don't see anybody. <laughs> How does that feel for you? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, commentating again. Um, I'm thankful that I had the experience prior to that in England. Um, but the advantage though this time around is that the cricket sort of take center stage, the performance on the field, um, the theatrics and stuff that we saw, we see a lot of with the crowds and the music. The, 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 the watchers will miss that. But for yeah. me as a broadcaster, I'm very, very focused on performance, bat, ball, catching. And so that has been interesting. One of the other disadvantages has been playing on only two venues. Obviously, the yeah. pitches get tired a little bit. But still we're happy to have cricket yeah i think that's a big thing do you find it very difficult just sitting uh and focusing on cricket or do you find it's a lot better now with no crowds don't have to worry about anything else um for me it doesn't make much of a difference because i i just love cricket anyway and i, I love watching i love the job that we do so without the noise it is strange without uh, walking around the ground and, and having no one shout advice or, or shout names um, is also different. But by some strange way, with the cricket taking center stage, the, the bat and ball on the field, it is intriguing in its own way. Absolutely. I'm going to move you know, to the CPL. Yeah. Has it affected the players? Is the performance any better? You know, the crowds behind those players, you know, push some players on are you finding that lacking a bit i think there are some players and i haven't spoken to them about this but i'm sure that there will be some players who thrive on crowds it's similar to test match cricket um, yeah. you would have some players in a test match or one day international who would thrive on the energy of the crowd um, they would absorb that and that would push them on to do things spur them on whereas for example, for myself, if I, if I was still playing, because a lot of us play cricket on the subcontinent at times when there were not many people watching some of the test matches, and even for the modern guys who play in the UAE, for example, yeah. where the, the crowds are almost minimal, it doesn't really matter. So it's different for different people. The Pakistani players are performing quite well in CPL. Do you attribute that to them playing you in UAE <laughs> without crowds? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we have some Afghan guys as well yeah. Um, yeah. Who, are, who are doing exceptionally well. I, I don't think that the lack of crowd is having a deleterious effect on performances. I, I yeah. think there are one or two guys who would be pushed further. But I think generally, I know one guy told me, and he's a star player, I don't want to call his name, uh, he's an exceptional player in the CPL and in, in the world game. He said to me, once he crosses the boundary line and gets onto the field, 
he does not notice whether there's a crowd or whether there isn't a crowd because he, he is just zoned in on what's happening between himself when he's bowling uh, to a batsman. You know, you talked about your own playing days. Ian, I'm going to take you back. And for some reason, you talked about playing in the subcontinent. For some yeah. odd reason, your favorite team seemed to be Pakistan. Every time you played against Pakistan, you tended to get more. You tend to get more wickets against them. <laughs> uh, I, haven't <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked that. So I, I really haven't checked that. Um, but I'll tell you, one of the things when we played, myself, Kirtley Ambrose, Courtney Walsh, etc., Brian Lara, etc., at the time that we played, we felt that Pakistan were probably one, if not the most difficult opposition for us to play against. For this reason, they played with flair. They reminded us of some of the West Indies teams that we were playing in back in the day. A yeah. yeah. lot of good fast bowling, uh, batsmen who would play with a lot of flair. And that in itself was attractive and combative for us. So we rated them very, very highly. You know, you talk about uh, the flair piece. You know, I think back in the days, Pakistan team played with a lot of heart as well. Do you see oh, that kind of walking away? Pakistan walking away from it lately? I think teams have gone through transitions. Pakistan, they've always played with heart. I mean, you think about the legacy left by Imran when yeah. he marshaled that young team to the 92 World Cup, 92-93 yeah. World Cup. Uh, the great Javid Miandad. And then you had Waka, Yunus, Wazim Akram, all those guys coming through. So there was the flair, but there was also great character and never say die attitude in, in what they did. Um, now, there are some nice young bowler Salman coming through. Um, Shaheen Shah, Afridi, yeah. uh, young Shah. Um, and then Haider Ali is an under-19 player that I saw earlier in the year. And he looks to have much of what Babar Azam has in terms yeah. of a skill set as a batter. So there's no doubt Pakistan's development was a little bit hindered by not being able to play at home. But, I mean, you look at what they did in the UAE. Under the leadership of their various captains, uh, Miss Bar did a terrific job in those conditions. So I, I, I think Pakistan are finding new talent and, and are making their way back. So, Ian, you played at national cricket. How important? So, I'm asking you from a player's perspective. Yeah. How important is it for any player to play at home? It depends on the player. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to joke with my colleagues before that West Indian crowds were so knowledgeable about the game. And so, I came on the back of a very great era. Remember, oh, we I had lost holding. Oh. Ghana, uh, Marshall was into the last couple of years of his career. Lloyd, uh, Greenwich and Haynes didn't play but a couple of years when I started. So the expectation of West Indian crowds because of that great, great era of West Indies cricket was a burden that we had to carry. So the expectation left no margin for error with us. And there were times when I sort of preferred to play away from home because I felt that <laughs> I, I could express myself without <laughs> um, letting down the home supporters. Um, however, I know that there are a lot of players who thrive on that home crowd, the energy of that home crowd pushing them on. So again, it's different for different players, but I think we were more familiar with home conditions. So if given a choice, yeah, home is good. So you know, you talk about the era and the players you replace. I think in some ways you, Curtly Ambrose, Courtney Walsh, kind of carried that work forward. You didn't let it drop. The trio. Uh, you, your playing days, how much pressure was that on you? Because you always came in as a third steamer when, when uh, Ambrose was done, Courtney Walsh was done, and you came in. You, how much pressure was on you to keep up the pressure that they had built on teams? It, initially, it wasn't that difficult. Because when I came in, Malcolm Marshall, as I said, was at the back end of his career. So he took me yeah. under his wing. Oh. Courtney Walsh had established himself as a senior player in the team by then. So, yeah. um, and Kirtley Ambrose and I sort of started 
around the same time, he was a few months into the team before I was, but he went on to become a great player. So we shared the new ball together before pre-injury in my days. Uh, and then once I started coming back from injury, Courtney Walsh and Ambrose formed their great, great partnership. So it wasn't really that much pressure. What, what I felt was that I had let myself down in some ways by not being able to live up to my own expectations, but it had nothing to do with pressure from anyone else. Yeah, well, you were very fa very quick to 100 test wickets in just in 21 tests. Where do you feel you let yourself down? The injury certainly. Uh, yeah, it started well. It started well uh, for a couple of years. And then I had a couple of back injuries, maybe about a year or 16 months apart. And, and what that did was I had to change my action a couple of times. Yeah. And so in attempting to do that, I kind of lost the natural feel for my bowling. And I've always shared the story with colleagues that the last, I would say, three or four years of my career, I found that every day I was turning up for a game and almost trying to search for what was the best rhythm for my technique. And that perpetual search to find whether my head was falling away, whether my left shoulder was opening up too early, whether my feet were splaying too much, became a huge burden. So I started focusing on technique in the middle of a game yeah, instead yeah. of focusing on execution. And that was tough and it wasn't fun. So you weren't able to execute anything then? Pretty much. I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. I knew yeah. I, I, I had the nous of what would work, what length would work, what type of delivery would work. But what I was finding was that I'd have great consistency and execution, let's say, for two test matches. Yeah. And then the next test match, I'd be searching for that same rhythm. And then from series to series, it would fluctuate. And sometimes you dread getting out of bed in the morning, fearing <laughs> that it would be one of the bad days. But I thoroughly enjoyed that search. I think it made me more knowledgeable about my art form because I had to try to decipher so much. Yeah. So in some ways it prepared me for life after the game. Vish, it's so funny, the timing of your career, the way it spanned, you know, the high rise and then, then slow, slowly you went towards, you know, more technicalities, more worrying about other things than execution. West Indies cricket sort of followed that path, right? And where did you see it start going down? Like they were just on top of everything. Yes. Um, unfortunately, the way the social scientists, I suppose, and, and yeah. the cricket historians have studied it was that coming through the late 70s into the 80s, we had these informal structures. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. It, it, yeah. It's like this. When I played my first season, and the guys always laugh at me, of domestic cricket in 1987. So I was just about 19 years old. I played two games, one against Guyana, which included Roger Harper, uh, guys like that. And then the second game, first class game was against Barbados. Gordon Greenwich scored a double hundred in that game. So we were playing against Greenwich and Marshall and those guys. And after that second game, I said, no, this is too hard. There has to be a better way to earn money for a career. So we had these tough informal structures that galvanized the best out of our players. The rest of the world studied all of that and put things in place to improve their cricket, building a lot off of what our great players had done. And we sort of economically deprived in our part of the world as well, didn't build upon the structures. So we were overtaken and now the economic disparity is not allowing us to be able to put structures to develop what is still great talent in the Caribbean. So where is that talent gone? Because CPL's on is is on. And you know one of the questions that just popped up from one of the viewers, Kimmy, she's asking which player in the CPL this year do you enjoy watching the most? Right. Um Look, I'll be honest and tell you that T20 cricket is a different beast. Huh? 
It yeah. depends on what type of cricket you're looking to develop. We have a good group of young fast bowlers out here. Jaden Seals, Anderson Phillips, Chima Holder, uh, Obed McCoy, a number of guys who I would think Ian Harding could go on to be good. Um, O'Shane Thomas, Odin Smith, good pace and good first-class players. The problem that we're having and the challenge is to get batsmen. I don't think we're developing as many long-form batsmen somehow as we should have. And that has something to do with pitches. It has something to do with maybe coaching. It has something to do with what's happening at club level. But we've got fast bowling depth. And if we procure it well, it'll hold us in good stead. So, Ian, why is it, you know, for someone from my side of the world, Pakistan, yeah. right now I live in Canada, why is it that Pakistan's story follows that West Indies? They, they, they were the two sides everybody wanted to play against, played with lots of flair, had the fastballing talent, crazy talent. Their batsmen, you know, they played with a lot of flair. And then they've kind of followed the same path. Pakistan still produces awesome fastballers. England yes. uh, in uh, West Indies win one against England very recently based on the back of their fastballing. Again, right? Yeah. Uh, why is it that... Where do you think there's a similarity between Pakistan and West Indies the way they approach their cricket now? They're both very good in T20 cricket as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point you make, actually. Um, that's an excellent point. West Indies have a number of... I think historically... We've had good athletes. We've had very strong uh, baseline people who are dynamic. So we don't have much of a problem bowling fast as long as we're encouraged to do so. The, the, the challenge really is to find technically strong batsmen who are willing, one, to bat for long periods of time training them and nurturing them to bat long periods of time because that involves a technique that will withstand 90 overs a day. Yeah. And so for some reason, conditions in both countries and structures in both countries have not fostered that. Whereas I always say that I can pick a guy off the street and teach him to bowl and perhaps get him to get several deliveries down near the a good direction, but yeah. batting is unforgiving. So it demands more technical work. True. So, you know, one thing I'm, I'm going to take you uh, to this the similarity of the pitches in both countries. Yeah. Mainly on the slow side, this is why fast bowlers have to always put in the extra effort. Right? right. They become very used to putting the extra effort. Batters play on slow pitches, so when they go out, they struggle. Has that anything to have, instead of, you know, focusing on finding better coaches, should they be investing, both West Indies and Pakistan, be investing better pitchers? <laughs> the West Indies have started doing that, actually, yeah. because they have recognized over the last two decades that the pitches slowed down so much that exactly what you said took place. There was a generation of West Indies batsmen who grew up on very slow pitches, not their fault. Yeah. Um, you conform to your environment. And so once they got to, say, Australia or even to England, they found that those guys had a problem dealing with the short ball and still do. But the last two seasons, three seasons, we've started putting more into domestic pitches here with the hope that, one, our fast bowlers will be encouraged and prosper more, and two, our batsmen will learn to deal with the bounce and the pace and the swing a little bit better because, I mean, look, historically, Richards, Greenwich, Haynes, Lloyd, Richardson, oh, yeah. great players oh, of fast bowling. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Marshall, Ghana, oh. uh, Roberts, great fast bowlers. Now we are being bounced out by oppositions, <laughs> right? Yeah, so I can't speak for Pakistan because I haven't obviously been there for such a long time to understand better what's, what's going, going on. on. Exactly. So, you know, you talk about, I'm going to take you back to your own career. You had a wonderful start. Injury changed everything for you. So these pitches, how much does it affect? They produce incredible fastballs. Pakistan does. Mohammed Zayed was another a name back in the days. 
who played yes. really good cricket. We lost him due injury. We lost many such great talent. How much do you think it impacts the fast bowler? You bowled on those pitches in Pakistan and West Indies. How much? What kind of an impact does it have on you as a bowler? I always felt that if I wanted to bowl fast, and if you want to bowl fast, the pitch is taken out of the equation. You'll oh. bowl fast no matter what. And we saw that, for example, with Waka, Wazim, Shoibakta, that there are games that they played, they took the pitch out of the equation. The oh, pitch didn't yeah, need the bounce absolutely. and pace. Yeah. But as an encouragement to a young bowler coming through, that's where I feel that you want to have those role models. You want to have those conditions that encourage those guys to want to bowl fast. Otherwise, people want to be batsmen or spinners all the time. But once, <laughs> exactly. once you, you have the role models um, that we're seeing, that we saw in the last 20 years, the actors, uh, the Ambrose, the Walsh, the Wazim Akrans, then the next generation wants to do that as well, irrespective of the pitches. So while the pitches are slightly important, I don't think that they are absolutely necessary. That's just my personal thing. You yeah. want to bowl fast, you'll bowl fast regardless. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to go back to talk about batting a lot. One thing I really enjoyed back in the day, I was fairly young. One thing I enjoyed your battles with Pakistani bowlers when you were batting. I remember there was one game which Wesley was about to lose and you hit Vakar for a six. It was in charge hours. I believe. You played with a lot of heart. You had a great average too for somebody that came so low uh, down the order. Why do you never focus on batting, Bishop? Because when I started out at school, actually, I started out as an opening batsman at secondary oh, school wow. when I picked up the game. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of fast bowlers did, though. Uh, you talk to Michael Holing and he'd probably tell you the same thing. Um, <laughs> and then as I started getting taller and purely out of coincidence, I took up bowling. And then as I grew stronger, the bowling superseded the batting. The guys used to call me Jeff Boycott in school because I'd bat for long periods and not score a run, but I'd, I'd just keep batting and batting and batting. But then as that transition took place from the under-19 level of cricket into senior cricket, back then we were so specific about perfecting our primary skill that I always enjoyed batting and I felt I underperformed as a batsman at international level. I should really have scored more runs. But our practice sessions were so designed to maximize the bowling skill and having to bowl at the top class batsman because we didn't always have the net bowlers and all of those things that teams have now when they talk. So by the time you came to bat, everybody was tired. <laughs> everybody was ready to go home. <laughs> and the, bat, the, the batting sort of suffered. So it's my fault in that I really focused on my primary skill a lot and tried to be the best bowler that I could be just to stay in the game that I didn't focus enough on my batting. So if you were still playing yeah, and the way the games changed, how important yeah. would that have been to focus on everything? Oh. Ooh, well, it, it's super, super important because one, we would have the, the bowling machines if you wanted. Yeah. You'd have sure. multiple net bowlers pre-pandemic. You don't have them now post-pandemic, <laughs> yeah. only your teammates. Um, yeah. We would also have facilities that are, are vastly different from what yeah. we used to have. And now I think too, in the last 20 years, coaches have decided that every bats, every player in the team had to learn to improve his batting. And that has been a significant driver. So I think you're seeing a lot of low order batsmen now who are improving over time. You don't have too many of the Chris Martins and the Devon Malcolms with the bat, the Lance Gibbs with the bat from days gone by. You're forgetting our friend Danny. <laughs> I didn't want to call his name um, <laughs> because we were teasing him the other night in the CPL oh. box, actually, because he, he <laughs> took up Rovman Powell's bat and we could see him talking to Rovman Powell and holding Rovman's bat. And he, and he came back to the box and we said, Danny, 
Ruffman is doomed to failure today because you <laughs> touched his back. And you know, he started waxing lyrical about the time that he held Sachin Tendulkar's bat and Sachin scored 100, as if Sachin oh, needed him to hold his bat <laughs> to score 100. Was Sachin, was he holding Sachin's bat upside down? You got to figure that part out, right? <laughs> well, definitely, definitely. Yeah. But no, Danny, Danny was one of those back in the day. And the thing about Danny is, if Danny had focused more, on his batting because he did play a couple of very obdurate innings during his test career. Yeah, but again, yeah, yeah. in our time, the primary role was the one that sucked all our attention. Oh, his his last uh, test inning actually saved the game. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. He lasted so that long. Play. But it's it's funny how cricket has evolved. Where do you see you know the this cricket going post COVID now? You're you're kind of playing in the bio bubble. You think international cricket can survive in this in this environment for, for, for a little I, longer? I, I hope, well, for as long as it, it takes to just have cricket, I hope that that continues. But there's a half of me that hopes that we normalize somewhere close to what it used to be pre-pandemic because life in the bubble is hard for the players, man. Um, you had guys who were in England a month before the tour started. Then they were in the same bio bubble for the duration of the series. Then they've come home to the CPL. They're still in a bubble. I'm, I'm talking to you now, Salman, from the hotel that we're staying at. I haven't seen my wife and kids since the end of June. My yes. wife dri drives past my hotel door where I'm sitting now every day on her way to work. Yeah. She drives past the hotel every day and I cannot see her still because we're in the bubble. So from a mental health perspective, yeah. I think it's it's too costly. It's too restrictive. I'm glad we're having it, but I hope we find a solution soon because to do this every tour is going to be incredibly difficult and stressful. Plus, domestic cricket in the Caribbean cannot be sustained if every time a team has to go somewhere, they have to go into a bubble. It's too expensive. So, you know, when you talk about the fact that CPL is going great, but they're confined to two, two locations, what does that do for cricket? For the it allow, Yeah, well, given the conditions of the world, and there are many people worse off than us, so we are fortunate, as hard as it is, people have lost jobs, businesses, lives, etc., so we are happy that cricket is being played to provide some escapism for the many folks around the country, the region, and the world. There are, as you would know, there are, I suppose, spin-offs with cameramen, VT operators, um, caterers, people that work around the game, sports channels that depend on live cricket. One guy told me the other day, he said, Bish, I haven't worked for six months because he works around cricket. He said, I haven't had a job for six months. Imagine wow. that since February, he has not worked. So the sooner we find a cure for this thing is going to be the better. Borders have been shut here in Trinidad since March. You can't go out and come in as freely as you want. You have to have exemptions. It's tough. So I hope we find a solution. And I think we're facing the same in Canada as well. Borders being completely yeah. shut. Uh, yeah. Global T20 is something you've you've been part of in the past. Here in Canada, I've watched it. I've watched it. Yeah. How do you find that? Just watching, you know, a, a tournament happening so close to home, which is in Canada, like you know, not too far from you. Do yeah. you think this kind of these kind of tournaments are great for countries like Canada to bring their cricket up? It creates interest when you have tournaments like that, as long as they are well-sanctioned and well-run. That's a caveat. As long as they are well-run, there is nothing but a bonus and a plus for cricket in North America. Yeah, exactly. Um, it encourages local talent to come through. It allows some of that local talent to play with global superstars learn, rub shoulders with those guys, understand how to prepare, how to practice, how to think about the game during a match. So it is very beneficial as long as it's done well. Yeah, exactly. 
it's funny you say that there's so many teams from west indies or caribbean so many people live here in canada i actually played for a club called kaichur was from okay. trinidad here in okay. the league you see so much passion and so much uh west indies cricket has done for for north america in terms of cricket like usa and canada i'm going to take you back to the last two questions i have one is being a cricketer and then transitioning into the broadcasting work how difficult was that how different was that very and why <laughs> <laughs> very different so when i when i was coming towards the end of my career about halfway through i had already started thinking about life after the game and to be honest with you i said to myself i don't want to be a wrong cricket at all when i'm finished because wow. I understand this the synergy of a dressing room. I understand superstar players having played with them. And as sportsmen we can be hard work, myself included. Yeah. And I didn't think that I wanted to have to to coach a player or to have to ask a player for interviews. It is only because by God's design and his hand that when I was injured the first time I did some radio work. as soon as i retired and stopped playing a radio station came to me and asked me to fill in on a test series in the caribbean then a television station asked me to fill in for one game i think michael holding couldn't be available wasn't available that year so they asked me to fill in and i just kept doing these little fill ins for about 2 years and eventually channel 4 in the uk were there was a west indies tour to england and they asked me through a friend of mine if i'd be interested to send and i sent them a demo through an agent friend of mine but i thought nothing of it and then they said yes michael holding apparently had put in a good word for me and said yeah this should be good sort of sort of thing and that's how it really kicked off it wasn't by design it was almost purely coincidental so this you've you know you played lots of cricket but you've covered a lot of cricket as well Yeah. in the past many years right what have you enjoyed the most coming test matches world cups icc tournaments what do you enjoy the most as a broadcaster I, yeah yeah um well first of all i enjoy watching cricket so it never feels like work for me i have never woken up one day since my playing career has finished and not enjoyed going to work every day has been a blessing so the last world cup for example the last world cup final was a dream when England played New Zealand at Lords. Oh yeah. I really do enjoy also the under 19 cricket world cups because I get to see young talent. Hyder Ali as I mentioned before. We saw Shaheen Shah Afridi um two world cups ago in New Zealand. So we're seeing all these young stars at an early age with Nicholas Puran from the West Indies and then we're following them on to the world stage. Um I love the narrative of a test match. It gives you time, but I also love the the matchup and and the schemes of a T20 game. So I really enjoy all forms of the game at any level. Do you see a future for T10, Vish, at an international level? You ask some hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> um I haven't experienced it yet. apart from watching it so i don't want to give a considered view on that because i think it's too early i have a sneaky feeling though that the pace at which society moves we will eventually get there uh, perhaps at the inter um i'm sort of still battling with test with t20 cricket and trying to to understand it even more just as yeah. players do so i don't want to jump yet to t10 i really don't not an international if t10 does grow it will grow at the expense of what <sighs> something's got to give <laughs> yeah um i have a feeling it will be 50 over cricket is it 50 over cricket seems to be the most vulnerable component of the game so that is the fear that i have but the challenge though is test cricket i love test cricket 
but future generations, and I'm talking 10 years from now, I'm also not sure how much into test match cricket they will be to sit for four or five days to see the conclusion of test match. So I don't want to go there, but you took me there, Bish. <laughs> One last question. Has ICC done enough for test cricket? We just saw the washouts with the rain and all that. Have we done enough innovation? Has ICC done enough innovations to support test cricket? Apart from just pink ball and red light and lights in cricket. Have they done enough? Hmm. I think everybody can almost do more, but I'll, I'll phrase my question this way. Test cricket is what it is. I'm a fan of four day test match cricket because I think it speeds up the game. It absolutely you have to prepare prepare more bowler friendly pitches, which makes for more attractive watching because you almost feel that every couple of overs a wicket could fall. Um, the drawback is the weather. If one day gets hampered by rain, then you you can't get a competition. So I think the ICC. When we talked about changing the color of the ball and stuff, day night test cricket, remember a number of players were saying the integrity of the game won't be the same and all of that. So for a governing body, I find it, I'm not part of it, but I find it difficult because on the one hand, the fans want one thing and then some of the players are saying no or yes, and it's too hard. Um, I hope that test cricket survives yeah. Because I think long form cricket prepares players even better for short form. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think there's nothing holding ICC back from going to a four day test, keeping it five, building a rain day in there to actually make test cricket survive, right? Keep it five, but play for four days. Oh, is it? <laughs> of course, money. Of course, money. It costs to go. do that sort of thing. That's, that's what a lot of people don't understand that costs. That is yeah, that's cost. true. That is true. Well, if they ever go to four-day test, Bish, I'll see Pakistan and West Indies go back on top because we, we have a lack of long-term focus. <laughs> Our battery. That, that could change. Proper <laughs> structures and proper training. Hi there, Ali. Remember that young yeah. fella. I hope he becomes a great oh, coach. Oh, absolute team. talent. The way he played, he, it looked like he belonged. I don't know if you got to see that innings, but it looked like he belonged. I didn't see it there because we were at yeah. work. Um, but look, in Babarazan, for example, you have a young man who easy, it's not easy to cross format these days. You look at the number of batsmen who play well across formats, there's not yeah. many of them. So there is hope and talent there, not only for, um, for Pakistan, but for West Indies as well. So one last question, Bish, before we wrap it up, and thank you again for giving us the time. Which is one Pakistan player you enjoyed playing against the most in your playing days? I won't call a batsman because batsmen were just too hard to <laughs> bowl to. Yeah, um, absolutely. I can I can put it this way. Uh was in by as I call him. Um I remember one time I was playing for Dabsha against Lancashire. And Wazim was obviously playing for Lancashire at the time. And he gave me a piece of advice because I had a bad game against him. And I never forgot that. He took his time, he came to me and he said, Bish, you bowled well when you played against us at Chesterfield a few weeks ago. Now you've come to Old Trafford and you're trying to do the same thing, conditions are different. I want to advise you that you need to be able to adjust to different conditions. And just for that, I took a liking to the kindness of Wazim. And Wazim's bowling was fearsome. It was complete. Um, his batting was a little topsy-turvy at times, but he's the one guy that I respect most out of all those that I played against. Was he Makram? Absolutely. And I, I mean, he's a, he's a legend for sure for Pakistan. And I think he's, he's doing a fabulous job in that commentary box as well now. Yes. So, which, yes. Is, which is great to see, which is great to hear some voices from Pakistan as well. Vish, Absolutely. thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for making the time. And uh, I'll let you go. I know you have a busy day ahead of you. Thank you again for joining Basha, and we'll talk to you again. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, bye. 
that was uh, that was none other than Ian Bishop. It was such a pleasure talking to him. Thank you guys for watching the show. Make sure you do like the video, subscribe to our channel, and push it out. We have an exciting uh, lineup today. We have Jeremy Gordon, a Canadian player, joining us later tonight, as well as none other than Dennis Friedman from Dennis Das Pakistan or Dennis Das Cricket fame. He's going to be joining us uh, tonight again at, uh, I believe, 9 p.m. Toronto time to do a very special episode on Pakistan versus England, the honest review of the series. So, guys, keep watching, Basha. It has been a pleasure bringing you none other than Ian Bishop, uh, uh, former international player for West Indies and, and now a wonderfully known commentator, very famous commentator uh, of the, the field of in the field of cricket. Keep watching, Bacha. This is your host, Salman Khan, signing out. And we will talk to you later. Keep watching, Bacha. Bye.